Here is a typical stretch of mainline track. It's just part of the length maintained by one gang. Like many other lengths, it carries traffic of every kind. Fast passenger trains, mineral trains running day and night, freight trains and pickups. Yes, traffic of all sorts. It's the ganger's job to inspect his length regularly, notice the small faults before they develop and have them attended to. For traffic of such weights and speeds, the track requires a very high standard of maintenance. All traffic imposes strains on the line, which can only be countered by the watchful care of the length gang. And here they are, assembling at the start of a day's work. Bob Taylor, the ganger, knows which places need attention, and his length men, Pat, Sammy and Fred, are there to help him put them right. In permanent way work, the idea is to attend to small defects before they develop into big ones. Over there is some ballast that needs squaring up. Pat and Fred can get on with it while Bob and Sammy carry on. On bullheaded track, Bob always keeps an eye on the keys in the chairs. The purpose of the key is to hold the rail firmly in the chair. If keys are loose or out, the rail is not firmly held. Sometimes the wood key becomes worn or shrinks. In a case like this, use a wood key packing. This takes up the wear in the key and allows the rail to be held securely once more. Steel keys are often used nowadays instead of wooden ones. The same rules apply. And worn steel keys can be made useful once more with the steel key packing. Now for the chair fastening itself. A typical fault is the loose chair screw. The remedy is obvious, but remember, if all chair screws were always tight, then many faults would never occur. Here is a worn ferrule. To replace it, you need to remove the chair screw which fits inside it. Because the ferrule was worn, the chair became loose in its seating. You can see how its movement has indented the sleeper. Look how badly worn the old ferrule is compared with the new one. Another common fault in chair fastenings is the enlarged fastening hole. This time the screw is so loose it can be removed by hand. There are several ways of refixing the chair screw in the enlarged hole. First, the VV coil method. For this, you need a new ferrule, an oil pot, a VV coil and a mandrel. The ferrule goes in first. Then the mandrel and the VV coil are screwed together by hand.
The two of them can then be screwed into the enlarged hole. Now, if you unscrew the mandrel, the coil remains in place in the enlarged hole and the original chair screw can be replaced. The VV coil bites into the wood of the sleeper and allows the chair screw to get a firm hold once more. There's another type of VV coil called the VV2. You can tell it by the tiny spot welds at the lower end. This type is screwed directly onto the chair screw itself. No mandrel is needed. Now you can insert the chair screw with the coil upon it into the enlarged hole. Once again, the chair will be firmly held. If you ever need to take the chair screw out to replace a ferrule, for example, you can do so. The VV2 will stay in place, ready for the chair screw to be put back. Another method of dealing with enlarged holes is to use fill plug compound, a dry substance which, when mixed with water, forms a paste that will set hard. Notice how Bob works the paste and shapes it so that it will go into the enlarged hole. He uses the rammer to force the paste down to the bottom of the hole. Then the former taps a rough thread into the sticky fill plug. This makes a path for the chair screw itself. In a few minutes, the fill plug will have set hard around the screw, holding it firmly in the sleeper. As an alternative to VV coils or fill plug, an oversized chair screw, known as a maintenance screw, can be used. Loose fastenings, if they're not attended to, can easily result in the track spreading wide to gauge. Here's a case in point. You can see how the chair has shifted outwards on the sleeper and how the screws are loose and slanting. There's only one thing to do, re-gauge the track. All fastenings are removed and the ballast opened out. The chairs can now be slid off the sleeper and the old fastening holes can be plugged with wood. An adze is used to neaten off the sleeper surface. Now that the sleeper is free, it can be pushed through allowing the chairs to rest once more on good wood. Next, the fastenings on one side must be secured.
On the other side, the rail is held into gauge with a bar, while new fastening holes are made. Bob watches carefully to make sure the rail is held firmly against the gauge the whole time. With the chair screws replaced, the line will once more be true to gauge. On some stretches, the chairs are secured not with screws, but with bolts. Sometimes two bolts, sometimes three. One of the commonest failings in chair bolted track is stripping of the bolt threads. You'll need jacks to deal with this fault. But the first thing is to dig a pit next to the offending sleeper. With the track jacked up, a little effort will swing the sleeper over the pit. Now Bob has room to get at the bolt from the underside of the sleeper. The new bolt goes in the same way. This line is track circuited. Notice that the insulator goes on before the washer. Now the sleeper can be returned to its original bed and the jacks released. All that remains is to screw the fastenings tight, replace the keys and make good the ballast. Another common fault is the hanging sleeper. Notice the gap between the foot of the rail and the chair and look for faint rust marks all round the base of the chair. Now watch a train passing over a hanging sleeper. The sleeper is not properly supported in its bed and must be packed with chippings. The amount of chippings is determined by judgment and they must be spread evenly below the sleeper. As well as the older bullheader track, Bob has some of the standard flat bottom type on his length. The fastenings here are different. There are several kinds. The Macbeth spike anchor, the elastic spike, 
the BR2 base plate with Macbeth spike anchors, the BR3 base plate with chair screw and elastic spike, the BR3 base plate with chair screw and Macbeth spike anchor, and the hook bolt, though this is not very common on plain line. All these must be kept tight. The elastic spike secures the foot of the rail to the base plate. It is important to keep spikes driven fully home so that they do their job properly. The same applies to Macbeth spike anchors. Notice that the correct gauge is always used. This prevents the spike being driven too far. Overdriving would break them. Now for rail joints. Expansion gap correct. No wear on the rail ends or fish plates. And the fish bolts properly screwed up. Under traffic, only the slightest movement can be seen at the joint. Fish bolts often work loose. Once again, it's obvious what to do. Sometimes the fish plate cracks, and then the only thing is to replace it with a new one. You will notice that when he is removing a fish plate, Bob always leaves the ongoing bolt till last as a safety precaution. He always examines the rail ends for wear and cleans them. He checks that there is enough oil on the fishing tables. He makes sure that the fishing surfaces of the new plate are well oiled too. This oiling of fish plates and fish bolts is an important precaution against track buckling in hot weather. Here is a rail joint in bad condition. The fishing tables of the rails are worn. If you look downwards onto the joint and compare it with a straight edge, you can see the wear at the center where the fish plate appears pulled in. The cure for worn joints is to use tapered shims. These are placed in pairs between the rail and the fish plate. They are thicker at the inner or joint ends. Their job is to take up the wear of fish plate and rail thus raising the running surface of the rails until they are level once more. Bob takes a look at the joint along the rail from some distance away to get an idea of the amount of wear. Next, he lays his straight edge along the running surface of the rail. You can see the gap between the straight edge and the rail. Now his tapered shim gauge will tell him the size of shim required. In this case, a number nine. A pair is needed for each side.
the shims fit with the thick ends innermost between the fish plate and the rail. When a pair of shims has been fitted on each side of the rail and the bolts tightened, the joint will be level again. Another method is to replace the worn plate by a hogback or maintenance fish plate. This has a raised section in the center to take up wear in the rail. Bob always sounds the sleepers after maintaining a worn joint and watches them under traffic. Yes, there is a slight vertical movement. So as before, the sleepers must be packed evenly with chippings to provide a firm bed for the track at the joint. All these faults can occur in either straight or curved track. But curves have problems of their own as well. On any curve, the outer rail must be higher than the inner rail by a definite amount, called the amount of cant. This is measured in inches and fractions of an inch. The proper amount of cant is stamped on monument blocks in the six foot. Here too is the scribe mark which is used in checking the alignment of the curve. Sometimes the amount of cant is shown on cant plates fixed to the sleeper. Bob's gauge has a spirit level and the position of the bubble tells him the actual amount of cant. If there is too little cant, void meters and sighting boards must be used to determine the quantity of chippings needed to restore the outer rail to its proper height. The number of canisters of chippings required is chalked on the rail at each sleeper. The standard canister is used, it is always filled the same amount and the chippings are evenly spread. The packing goes on until all the marked sleepers have been dealt with. Then the ballast shoulder is squared up and the whole job left neat and tidy. Sometimes curves get out of alignment, so that when the alignment gauge is placed above the monument block, the pointer is not directly above the scribe mark, as it should be. If you look carefully, you can see the kink in the rail. Bob decides that tracker liners must be used to pull the curve back into alignment. The alignment is not correct until the pointer is exactly above the scribe mark. For a bigger job, Bob gets extra help from the adjoining lengths. Eight men with bars can straighten out almost anything. Now let's run quickly through what we've seen. 
Keep the keys tight and use the proper packings when required. Keep the chair screws tight. When ferrules are worn, replace them. VV coils will deal with enlarged fastening holes. So will fill plug or maintenance chair screws. Keep the gauge correct. When chair bolts get worn, renew them. When you find hanging sleepers, pack them with chippings. Keep elastic spikes driven home to gauge. And do the same with Macbeth spike anchors. Keep fish bolts tight. If fish plates crack, replace them. At worn joints, fit shims or hogback plates. Pack the sleepers properly at the joints. On curves, preserve the correct amount of cant. When a curve is out of alignment, pull it back with track aligners or get extra help and do it with bars. The safety of our trains and the long life of the permanent way depend on gangs like this one.